I love this podcast. I love the idea of work isn't just a bucket. You know, there's work and then there's family and then there's friendships and relationships and then there's health. What if it's all just one big bucket, you know? And I think that's how I started looking at it, realizing that, you know, my business is a vehicle for things just the same way that my relationships are part of my network and that's a vehicle and the, you know, and so when you start looking at it kind of overall, and so I've never, um, at least in the last probably five years, you know, I haven't really looked at it like work. It's like, this is what I do. This is the Beats Working Show. We're on a mission to redeem work, the word, the place, and the way. I'm your host, Mark Wright. Join us because getting paid to practice beats working to get paid. Welcome to Beats Working. On the show this week, go ahead and jump. Just like the old Van Halen song, Jeff Hill has always been one of the first to leap at life's opportunities. Jeff is an entrepreneur and founding partner for 1-800-GOT-JUNK in Western Washington State. Maybe you've seen the ads on TV that say, just point and junk disappears. Jeff's story is closely tied to his constant focus on solving pain points in the world around him. In college near Spokane, Jeff started a company that reunited lost airline luggage with their owners. Today, he's one of the most tenured franchisees for 1-800-GOT-JUNK and has launched a new company called the Repurpose Center. The RPC's goal is to divert as much stuff away from landfills as possible and also to help those in need at the same time. Jeff believes that ideas don't have to be 100% baked before you launch. He says if you wait too long, you might miss out on opportunities. With decades of business experience that ranges from telecom to junk, Jeff is a big believer that work can be used to accomplish great things in every part of your life. So here's to seizing opportunities that make work so much more than a paycheck. Jeff Hill, welcome to the Beats Working Podcast. I've been looking forward to our time together. Yeah, me as well. Excited to spend some time with you today, Mark. So Jeff, when people ask what you do for a living, you know, we've all seen the TV commercials for the parent company. <laughs> what, what's your short answer, Jeff? You know, it probably depends on who's asking. You know, we've seen the commercials point and it disappears. Well, my company's the company that makes it disappear. So that's probably the simplest answer, but I'm the founding partner for a company called one 800 got junk of Seattle, Tacoma, Bellingham, Olympia, basically the greater Western Washington area with the exception of Seattle proper. That's a, that's a buddy of mine. And I've been doing that for about 21 years. And uh, in the last year, we've kind of doubled down on the recycling initiatives we've been building over, over a couple of decades and um, started a company called Repurpose Center. So I'm the president of that organization. And uh, put simply, 1-800-GOT-JUNK is responsible for the material acquisition, freeing up people's weekends and their time and their space by taking junk away. And then Repurpose Center is responsible for the diversion of that material to try to keep it, as much of it out of the landfill and uh, recycle it and repurpose it responsibly. Boy, we've come a long way, haven't we, Jeff, when it comes to how we deal with junk and garbage in our lives. I, I mean, I have memories as a kid, we would just load up the pickup truck and drive out into the country to the dump and just dump all of our stuff in the landfill. And yeah, that was a fun day, right? Yeah. I mean, you, it was you, kind you, of a you big leave deal. with as much stuff as you took usually. And yeah, yeah, things have changed a little bit, you know, even in the couple decades I've been in the business, you know, when we first started, part of what the one hair got junk model was kind of turning Sanford and Son on its ear, right? And so we added branded trucks, uniform drivers, on-time service, all the customer service bent. And then in the early days, you know, we had the ability to dispatch to our phone and stuff. So we really embraced technology. And, and so Part of bringing that to market was kind of teaching people that there's this new way that we're handling junk. And so it was, you know, that in itself was, they didn't know, do you pay us for the junk? Do we, you know, <laughs> I still get some of those questions, but not as many as I used to in those <laughs> early days. Now they kind of understand the model. And so now we're able to kind of really start to refine our operations to make sure that, you know, every aspect of the process, you know, is operationalized. And fortunately for us, we've been able to scale pretty nicely over the last uh, couple decades. And so it's a little easier to do some of the stuff when you're bigger, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. when you're 
the one guy in a truck trying to find somebody to help you as navigator. It's hard to focus on diversion and go to the metal yard and then try to hold host a garage sale and try to do all this stuff. So in the early days, we would just pick the stuff up and then essentially do some quick recycling, maybe strip out the metal and then take it to the landfill. And, and now it's just way more, way more sophisticated. And quite frankly, the most fun part of the business because yeah. it's, as they say, one man's junk is another man's treasure, but we're really finding that there's different uses for these materials in, you know, whether it's in the actual form that it came in or breaking it down to the smaller levels, the value increases, the smaller it gets. Right. And the reason that is, is because it takes a lot of little hands to deal with the recycling. And so it gets more and more expensive, but if we have scale, the right processes, the right community partners, we can really, um, exploit that in a great way. So that's what we're trying to do this year. So we'll get more into the business model in just a second. I just love, you know, your brand awareness is so great. I mean, who doesn't know about 1-800-GOT-JUNK? I just love it. But every entrepreneur that I've met, Jeff, and everyone that we've had on this show came to the realization that they were not like everyone else when they were a child. I mean, every single entrepreneur says, yeah, I knew about eight years old that I wasn't like everybody else. Yeah. And yeah. you developed a pretty uh, interesting knack at, at a young age of kind of figuring out the world around you. In the sixth grade, you started raising your hand first in class <laughs> when a teacher would ask for kids to participate. Yes. Yeah. And while the rest of us would be sitting on our hands, you your hand shot up because you figured out it would get it out of the way, number one, and you wouldn't be anxious about it. And yeah. also the teacher appreciated your participation. Take me back to young Jeff's life and who was that kid? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, just like anybody, sixth grade, entering middle school, trying to figure out who you were and what your secret powers were and whatever. And I was actually a real, real shy kid. I mean, prior to that, I remember, you know, I remember my dad trying to encourage me to call for an appointment that we needed to schedule and he'd have me do the phone call. And I'd remember being in tears because I was so nervous or whatever. And so something about that teacher, his name was Len Mortlock, you know, kind of allowed me to be a little bit brave. And, and then like, like you said, I mean, if I raised my hand first, turns out the teacher would grade a little easier, be a little easier on me. And then all that angst of me just waiting went away and I could sit back and almost smile and laugh at my friends that were <laughs> going through all that. So, so I think that's the kind of the first kind of taste of leaning in and being the first to jump or whatever. That's my wife says, she says, you're always the first to jump. And I think that's just essentially an, an, an entrepreneurial trait that I developed pretty early. And, and so, you know, I was always a bit of a self-starter and then, you know, like most entre entrepreneurs, I had a lot of ideas, you know, a lot of ideas. And so I always bring this stuff up and some stuff stuck, some stuff didn't, you know, some people thought I was crazy. And a lot of people thought I was crazy when I left telecom and started the junk removal company. They're like, they just didn't get it. But for someone like me, it's, it's so crystal in my head as to what we're trying to do. It's just, I could see it. And so if I can see it, I know I could build it, you know? Yeah. So you started your first business, I think, hauling lost luggage yeah. for the Spokane airport. How did that come about? I mean, I guess at the heart of it, and you told me this before, entrepreneurs are experts at discovering pain points and yeah. identifying friction in the world, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so two pain points I was addressing. The first was I graduated from college. I went to Eastern Washington University and I graduated around 94. I think it was 94 technically. And that there was a, there was like a little small recession going on. It was pretty tough for young 20, 21 year olds to go find jobs. And so I did like most people like me did at the time. And I went and worked selling high interest loans for a, a you know, a loan company and trying to figure out where I was. And I was, that was not my bag. You know, I did well at it and I, but it wasn't really, it didn't energize me. And one of my coworkers, uh, at the time had a husband who was running the Spokane International Airport. And so I would hear about some of the challenges they had. And, and when I heard, you know, the amount of luggage that didn't make it from Seattle to Spokane in the transfer, I was like, wow, that's, that's an interesting opportunity. And so kind of not knowing what I didn't know, I put together a proposal, a really simple one. It was super basic. I just said, I went to Alaska, Southwest, and at the time, Northwest Airlines was still in Spokane. And I went to all three of their, man I just asked for their manager and I passed them this document that said, hey, I gladly pick up any luggage that you need to deliver to the customer's home 
that got disconnected. And I put together a model and the further I had to drive, the the more I would charge. And it was kind of almost like a built it kind of like a taxi service. And and so so yeah, we were off and running. And you know, I hired my old fraternity brothers to be my drivers and uh when I couldn't drive. And uh, it was a it a super interesting experience. Learned a lot about one partnerships. I had a partner in that first endeavor and and I don't think we were completely aligned with what it would take to really scale that business. And so so you know, it was a, it was a short-lived venture, but it was it was probably the first real stab at it. Air Caddy Baggage Delivery Service is what I called it. <laughs> That's a cool name. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Of course, but, I always like the branding. The most fun part about starting a business is all the branding stuff, right? Yeah. But this is before Waze. This is before traffic apps, right? So yeah. did you have the old Thomas Guide or how did you find people's maps. homes? Yeah. Thomas yeah. Guides and maps. maps, you know, and we would, <laughs> you know, I, I literally would make out these maps and I'd draw circles and there'd be regions and I'd say, okay, downtown Spokane, I assume I'll probably have a couple of them because of the hotels. So I'll only charge 15 bucks. But if I have to go all the way up to Sandpoint or somewhere mm -hmm. that, you know, that's going to be 120 bucks. I can't imagine they'd want to pay that. But of course the airlines, you know, they're just trying to make it right by their customers because it was their, their mess up. And so, yeah, it was good. It was a, a good experience. Like I said, pretty, pretty short lived. And after a crazy holiday season, my business partner bailed. And so at that time, it seemed like a good time to make the jump. And I moved over here to Seattle. Yeah. Uh, Is that when after. you got into telecom, Jeff? Because mm -hmm. you started at Western Wireless, which yeah. later yeah, became um, Voice Stream. Yeah, I came over and didn't know what I wanted to do. Thought I was maybe an entrepreneur, but also didn't have the corporate experience that I knew would be valuable. And uh, in fact, I was I was on my third interview with Red Hook Brewery, right? And I oh. thought I was going to be the coolest job in the world. It was, it was entertaining out-of-town <laughs> distributors, working for a beer company. I mean, what... 22 year old wouldn't want a job like that. And, and this is back when they were in the old trolley bars yeah, in, in yeah, Fremont. Yeah, they were right? there and then they they were just kind of getting stuff moving up in uh in Woodenville and oh, you yeah. know and of course you know microbrews and all that stuff were a big thing and so so I was interviewing with them and multiple interviews and ultimately I didn't end up getting the job. It went to someone else that was maybe a little more qualified or I would argue maybe a little better looking, but um <laughs> but uh but then I went to you know I had I had been kind of checking out this operation. It was a call center operation for a company called Western Wireless. It was run by John Stanton, who's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty famous in our, in our area now. Yeah. Um, and kind of looked around and I, I saw these people that were kind of explaining and training and stuff. And they were the supervisors, obviously. And I hadn't really seen that environment. And I said, how long does it take to become one of those? And they told me six months. And so I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> you know? So I, but I told them I had another job offer at Red Hook. And so you, you got to hire me now or you're going to lose me. And so they hired me that day. And then I started the following Monday and four months later, I was a supervisor. Six months after that, I was a manager. And then it, by the time my stint was done, I was one of the younger directors they'd hired. But for those kind of that don't know telecom, Western became voice stream wireless pretty quickly. And then voice stream pretty quickly became T-Mobile. And so you know, I started when I went from Western, I took a team of 13 people to T-Mobile. And then from there, that grew to a department that was over 2000. And so by the time I left <laughs> and I was ready to leave, it was only six years, but I was ready. I, you know, I liked the 13. I liked the 14, I liked the 20 people, like one or two teams wearing a lot of hats. And then by the time it was 2000, it was a lot of the minutia that you, you hear about with big companies or whatever. And so I was ready to try something different. And I had just unfortunately had to do what you do in corporate America, which is lay some people off because they were going through some restructuring. And so hmm. I saw what the severance packages looked like. And I said, the next time they tried to change my job, I said, you know, I think I'd rather go that other route. I think I'd probably be happy with the severance and I, you know, quietly leave. So I left on good terms and then took my severance package and debated moving to Mexico, but that, <laughs> that was short lived because I worked pretty hard for that money. <laughs> and so, uh, and so that's actually the money. That's what bought my business was yeah. my uh, severance package from T-Mobile bought, bought one in here, got junk. So I much love for T-Mobile and, uh, yeah, it got me in business. Jeff, did you have a mentor in telecom or what, how did you learn how to manage other people or was it more inherent for you? Just sort of a natural thing. You know, I think some of the, the team leadership stuff was, just comes naturally to me. You know, I was part of a fraternity. I was part of a rugby team in college. I, you know, I've been part of team sports and was involved in student government and stuff prior to that when I was younger. And so I had the group dynamic stuff. But, you know, I think the greatest thing that I took from T-Mobile is having the good and the bad bosses, you know. And so I had, 
You know, I think I shared a story about the one boss that was just floored with me. She didn't understand why these people were doing what I said, even though I wasn't their boss. And she said, Jeff, help me understand why people, people just want to do stuff for you, even though they don't report to you. Why is that? You know? And I'm like, because we're helping. I mean, that's how it should be, isn't it? You know, she just never understood that, you know? And, and then I had some great, some great bosses. And I also had, I developed a friendship and a partnership with one of my vendors. And then when I left the industry, interestingly enough, I managed, uh, by the time I was leaving, I managed all the outside collection agencies and several of our call center partners and stuff. And when I left, I mean, I was kind of a big deal at T-Mobile then. And then I left and none of those people called. They all went, you know, cause I couldn't do anything for them anymore. Uh -huh. Right. And so it, I kind of had a lesson in who my real friends are and, and uh, there was one guy, his name's Rick Hunter, that really stuck with me. And he saw my vision for what I was trying to create. And he's just really supportive with me throughout the years. And so we've, through since then, that was, you know, 25 years ago. Since then, we've developed a more formalized, um, you know, I call him my mentor. And, mm -hmm. and he's just been really great. In fact, my oldest son is named after him. That's how hmm. much he means to me. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. But getting back to that question that manager asked, how come these people are doing all this stuff for you? Was it, was it just that, and I've had managers like I would kill for because mm -hmm. I knew that they cared about me and we actually had a relationship and yeah. that was the driving force. But get, getting deeper to that answer, what was it about how you showed up at work that, that caused so many people to say, yeah, I'll, I'll, Jeff wants that done. I'll do that. I cared about them and they knew that there was a level of sincerity there because, you know, it wasn't just about me. It was about the goal of what we were trying to do. And and then I think the other thing, and it's probably more obvious in the junk world because, you know, I was never afraid to roll up my sleeves and dive into the dumpster. You know what I mean? <laughs> and even in telecom, you know, I'd be the, you know, the crappy tasks or whatever. I'm like, I'll do it. If I'm going to ask somebody to do it, I need to be willing to do it myself. And I think people always appreciated that, you know, so, so that's been one of my kind of secrets there, but mostly it's just, just relationships. You know, I've always believed, you know, take care of those that take care of you. You know, and that's been a big part of our culture with my current company and, and even T-Mobile, you know, they, they've, they've built a really great culture and, you know, it's, it gets tested at times with the economy and stuff like that, but that, you know, that built and worked for some really amazing people and amazing teams. And so, and watching other people succeed has been, it, I take great pride in it, helping promote people out of my team. You know, I had an opportunity to do that. In fact, one of my, one of my best friends I brought in, in the early days of, T-Mobile has been retired for like four years. And I'm like, you know, part of me is <laughs> kicking myself. I'm like, wait a second, maybe I should have taken that job. But, you know, he was just super bright and super capable. And I recognized that early on because I knew him. But then when we brought him in and just watched him blossom, it was amazing. He became part of a, essentially the think tank. And then he got, he was able to exit at a 47 year old age. And it was just like, wow, so cool. So, and, yeah. and I take great pride in that and obviously get a free, free beer from them every time I see them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you decide not to retire to Mexico at, no. a, at an early age. In 2003, you came across a company you described as a funky little junk company up in Canada yeah. that had just won an award for call center of the year. So you go up North British Columbia, right? Mm -hmm. You meet the founder, Brian Scudamore. This is mm -hmm. the guy that we see on the ads now. That's just point and the junk disappears. What was your motivation for that first uh, that first foray up into Canada? Did you want to get a job with these guys, or what was your motivation? Um, so just back up. If I back up just a little bit, I was I told you I had a summer's package, mm -hmm. and I was kind of really looking at what I wanted to do, and I had that epiphany that, gosh, I really liked it when it was just fourteen people. I didn't like it when it was two thousand. You know what I mean? So that kind of so that kind of is like, okay, I'm, maybe I'm looking for a smaller company. Maybe the exciting stuff was the startup part, which where we were going through that growth or whatever. And so, so I was kind of looking for companies like that. The reason Canada hit my radar is because I had some friends that I used to travel with. I, speaking of Mexico, I'd travel with them to Mexico, some of my friends. And so I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I consider looking at Vancouver because I looked at the Seattle market and stuff. And there wasn't a lot that was calling me then. And so anyway, I ended up looking up in Vancouver and I... And I see this one ad for a call center director for a call center that's only like 30 people, but they had just won call center of the year, you know, and I know I come from the call center business. So I know that's American Express, that's Discover Card, that's, you know, the big guys that usually win those awards. So it instantly intrigued me. And then I went out and the way that he wrote the job description, just the words, 
there's been probably, I don't know, five times in my life where something just spoke to me in a way that I knew my life was going to be different after it. And that was one of them. I read that job description and it was like three in the morning. I had to respond to him. So I wrote him this huge, long response enough to get me invited to go up and interview for the job. But then I got went, then I got up there and, and they were doing some really progressive interviewing styles. They were doing like reverse panel where they'd have a couple people from the, the, the parent company. And then they'd have all the candidates that are applying in a row. And they're asking questions like, if we didn't hire you, which one of these people would you hire and why? And so they all said they'd hire me. I said I'd hire the guy that was, I knew they wouldn't choose because I wanted the job, you know? And uh, anyway, in the end, they ended up saying, you know, Jeff, honestly, we think you'd be bored after a little while. We think you're a little overqualified. And the truth was I'd run 300 person call centers, multiple, <sighs> you know, all these vendors and stuff. So it would have been a little bit of a, it, it, it may have looked like a little bit of a step back, but the other part of me going up there was I knew it was a franchise model. And so I thought it would be a good way to look under the hood and see what they're building and if it's legit or whatever. And so I got up there and just fell in love. As they say in the junk business, I drank the, the blue Kool-Aid, fell in love with Brian. I mean, Brian and I are the exact same age and kind of similar backgrounds. And, and so we hit it off. And so by the time I left there, they had basically convinced me to invest in the Bellevue side of, of greater Seattle. And the reason why was because uh, Nick, who was originally from Calgary, Canada, and he knew Brian in the early days, he came down to run Seattle, but because he was Canadian, he couldn't get financing for more than a couple trucks. And so hmm. he had his two truck operation. He's happy as a clam running around West Seattle and downtown. It was great. And so they ended up, one of her got junk ended up buying back the East side of Seattle. And it was just happened to be right when I was there. And so they said, Hey, you'd be perfect for this. I lived up in kind of the Bothell area. This was my stomps. And so, so yeah, I walked away with the business and started in November of 03 ordering one truck. And by the end of the winter, I had my second truck. And, and by the end of that year, I had worked myself out of the trucks and was just kind of being the ops manager and doing logistics. And yeah, it was quite a run. And so the company's about five years old at that point. So you're still in the early growth phase of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, right? Yeah. So anybody that's been involved with a franchise model understands when you sign on to an early franchise, you know, you're part of the team. You're, you're part of the one that's developing the processes, anything you're doing, sometimes you're doing for the first time. And so I like that feeling. I like that startup stuff. The, the colleagues that were buying the other cities, I became really great friends with. In fact, we started our own little kind of mentoring group together, the ones that were chasing that million dollar mark or even beyond. And so we started a group and, and we would get together and brainstorm. And then as we all grew our businesses, it, we started shifting towards second businesses and other opportunities. And so in fact, 10 years after I started the business, I chose one of them to be my business partner. And so I ended up bringing Ben Hoskins, who runs Portland East and San Diego 1-800-GOT-JUNK into my enterprise. And so now we're business partners and that's been probably the single best business decision I've ever made, you know, and, you know, I'm, you, you probably tell by me, I'm pretty high energy. I'm kind of a, probably more the marketing and sales side of the business and the discipline and the financial acumen and stuff I was learning as I went. And so to bring somebody in who has a, had an econ degree and, and just self-admittedly, you know, pretty conservative when it comes to how to manage finances and stuff. It just made for a really nice partnership. And, and in the early days, you know, as far as things that I would attribute our success to in the early days, we sat down and I remember Ben saying, you know, good contracts make good friends. So let's just really talk this through. And so we, we did a really good job just kind of identifying what each of our roles would be in the organization. In fact, in the early days, I agreed to stay on for a year, find my, my ops manager replacement, and then step away from the business for a while so he could kind of, because he was going to be the operating partner and I didn't want to usurp his authority or whatever. And so we did that. And I, and at that point met or hi, hired and worked with a guy named Jay Evans, who's, who's been my general manager ever since. And to call it, he's a business partner now, and he's probably just a huge asset to our organization. He's running our entire operation now, which is now, you know, a 50 truck operation that spans all of Western Washington. And so, so, you know, early on, 
partnered up with some great people and, and tried to, you know, put people in the right seats on the bus and really play to each other's strengths. And I think that's a lot of what you talk about on your podcast is kind of identifying kind of what your skill set is and then just lean into that and let the other people do the other stuff. And essentially that's the model, right? The junk model is, hey, hire somebody to, that, that can come with the tools, with the muscle, with the, you know, the processes or whatever, and let them do it instead of doing it yourself. Because anybody could rent a truck and go to the dump and do all that stuff. But, you know, who wants to make a, a one week project when these guys can show up and in a half hour, half hour, <laughs> have it out of your, out of your hair. So it's kind of, kind of that model. What's funny, Jeff, is that in hindsight, so many of these startup businesses, uh, it seems like, oh, well, that's a no brainer, but someone had to figure that out. You know, the yeah. rest of us are renting the truck, wasting half a day, maybe throwing our back out, finding yeah. out where do I get rid of this? Yeah. And you guys just discovered that this is kind of a pain for people to do. Yeah. So let's build a business around yeah. that. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I built a business around it and it's a pain for us to do. So that just reaffirms that we have something here because if we're living and breathing it and that's our profession and it's hard for us, I could only imagine what, you know, someone who doesn't know what to do with this extra paint and these, yeah. you know, these types of things. And so, yeah, it's been a, it's been a part of it is educating the public to what the service was. And we've been blessed with just some awesome customers and our early customers a lot of them become became raving fans. And, you know, unfortunately, I think we've learned that in the service industry, you know, not everybody's about service. And, and so we just really, for me, I just really leaned into that. I know what it feels like to have good service. And so that's what we try to build into our culture is that feeling of, wow, I, I feel really taken care of, you know, and, and I mean, in junk, it's as simple as stuff like, we do the sweep up afterwards. You know, that was just one of those little details, you know, and those tiny details where it's like, wow, they actually care about what they're doing. They're not just throwing this stuff in, breaking it, getting out of here. They're actually carefully putting it in. They're going to divert a bunch of the stuff. They're helping me with the cleanup. They're identifying other opportunities for me to maybe free up some space. Um, so that's been really fun, kind of building that team that can do that. And I'm guessing when you treat customers that way, they'll tell their friends and family and neighbors how what a great experience that, that is. I think the most frustrating thing for me when I deal with businesses as a customer is sometimes you just feel like, am I an actual inconvenience for you right yeah. now? Because I'm feeling like I'm inconveniencing you in some way. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> try calling a try calling them on the phone and be on on hold for 45 minutes. You don't yeah. feel valued. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so for us it was you know, just the little things, the call ahead, you know, Hey, we're supposed to be, you know, we're going to be there within an hour. And so it's like, Oh, okay. I know I can go to the bathroom. They're still an hour away. You're not just sitting there waiting, whatever. Right. Just those, That's again, I, I, I wrote a big article for my team in the early days and they still have it up on the wall. And it was just all the little things we can do to make people's experience better. And the list goes on. Right. And, and I would say the vast majority of them are free. You know what I mean? And that's why one, why I made the list. I'm like, look, we can differentiate without me throwing money because guess what? I didn't have money. I'm a bootstrap guy. So, so yeah, we just kind of built it that way. And, you know, it's super rewarding. We were at a, I was starting to tell you earlier about a charity golf tournament. We were out this, this Monday and Walter Jones shows up. Right. Oh. And I'm a big lifelong Seahawks fan. Big right. Seahawks so I made, oh my God. He's I huge. Made, Is he still oh as my, big as he was? Oh my gosh. And I'm a big man. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I used to fancy myself football player and stuff. And I stand up next to him. I'm like, Oh yeah. It's a good thing. I chose a different career for sure. But man, what a sweet guy. He was so great. And the first thing he said is I freaking love you guys. He goes, I use you guys all the time. Wow. And I'm like, let's go, you know? Cause again, when I, you know, two, three, four years in the business, people were still asking me, do we have to pay to get rid of the junk? And you know, brand awareness was, it was so low. It was like, you know, maybe by that time, maybe 15% of the population had heard of us, but now I'm pretty convinced that number's higher. And I apologize to everybody for maybe too many commercials sometimes or whatever. But, you know, we're trying to we're trying to teach people that, you know, life can be a little simpler. <laughs> yeah. Those commercials are kind of campy. They're kind of kind of homey and they're kind of goofy. And, I, I, you know, it makes you remember it. I mean, that's oh. that's for sure. When I go to when I go speak at the junior high, my, I have I have three sons and two of them are in middle school. And so they invite me to career day and. uh you know, I show up wearing the junk stuff. And man, when all the middle schoolers know the tone and the <laughs> point that disappears or whatever, I'm like, oh, we're doing something right. These are my future customers. This is good. This is good. You know, <laughs> so campy so, or not, it's working. 
<laughs> it is. It is. So the company, it's still privately held, right? One eighth and got junk. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah. got to be it's got to be valued in like the hundreds of millions now. And how did that growth is it I mean, obviously Brian is is, you know, a magnetic visionary almost like Richard Branson type yeah. guy, right? I mean, yeah. is that so how did this little company just catch fire like it has? Yeah, I mean, I can I mean, through the years I can tell you things that Brian Brian has told us personally, but I the the first thing that comes to mind is he says it's all about the people. And, and he firmly believes that, you know, hire good people, get out of their way, you know, and he did that not just with his, you know, headquarters employees that were running the call center and the marketing department or whatever, but with his franchise partners. So he found some really great franchise partners in the early days. You know, it was like the wild west because the cities weren't taken. And once we realized this model worked, it was a spending spree, right? Everybody was trying to buy up all the regions or whatever, but and then he developed the model. He's like, okay, so, you know, the Seattle's and the Calgary's and the San Francisco's and New York's, they're all taken. So now there's these smaller regions. And so then he really pushed to try to find what he called entrepreneurs, like, you know, maybe owner operator type owners and stuff. And, and so he just did a good job really finding people to help build it out. And yeah, I mean, I think he did, I think they're doing 800 million a year a Nash, inter, throughout the globe. I mean, yeah. we're... Australia, Canada, and United States primarily. Uh, but yeah, we've built within, within that organization, we've built a top 10 franchise in their system. And so, um, and that's, that's privately owned with just Ben and I. So that's been a nice, we have enough autonomy. We build the business, we engage in the community the way we want to engage. And then we get a little help from, from the team up North with the kind of the national, some of the national advertising campaigns and as well as the call center support and stuff. So, so a little of the stuff that would distract us, they help take care of, and it really just allows us to just be the operators we want to be. When we call that 1-800-GOT-JUNK number, does that go to a central call center? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, I think there's a couple of them now, but yeah, it goes to our call centers. There are employees, they have our system, they have our schedule, they have everything up there. So they've really worked on, on streamlining that and just really deliver, you know, kind of that early stuff we were talking about, the waiting on hold and stuff. I mean, we're really focused on not having any of that stuff getting in your way. And we understand like, you know, in those early days, you started seeing those junk trucks around. Well, it wasn't long until you started seeing other pretty junk trucks with guys in uniforms and doing, I mean, people catch on pretty quick. And so, <laughs> and you know, the other thing is, I don't think we were ever super threatened by that. In, in fact, it was like, okay, cool. That's going to make our job easier to explain what the service is because they do a similar service. Now my job is just to do it better or to have a better, you know, to be able to do it faster and, and follow through a little better. So it's been a kind of a crazy ride. And, and now it's just super fun because we're just discovering all the opportunities within the organization that maybe we couldn't do because of scale before. So hmm. I'm just tremendously jazzed about all the recycling stuff we're doing. And, and it's allowed me to kind of live me and my wife and my family live our values with regard to, you know, working with charitable organizations, mm -hmm. being engaged in the community. I mean, in the last week, we've sponsored a robotics camp, sponsored a uh, golf tournament for kids in our community that are trying to get their lives back on track. We've donated to Sophia Way, you know, for women in transition. I mean, the, all these things are awesome. And they're doing us a favor because it's keeping me from putting stuff in the landfill, but it's you know, so the stuff that we can make money off of can fuel our nonprofit stuff. And it's just super fun. And it's, it's given me a kind of a re-energized in the business. I was kind of, to be totally honest, was starting to kind of get a little antsy. He was starting to look at other things or whatever. And, and then this kind of, kind of reared its head and we listened to our customers and our customers now before the messaging was weird with the recycling, they're like, we just paid a lot of money to get rid of it. So we want to make sure we get our money's worth. And hmm. now they're like, we're willing to pay a lot of money if we know you're doing right by it and we know, and you could show us where this junk's going and how we're doing it. And so that's kind of what this year has been about is just really kind of re you know, reestablishing what it is we're doing here and, and our messaging. Yeah. That sounds like it feels much better than just, you know, paying and then it goes to a landfill. Yeah. So January, you step in as president of the Repurpose Center. Mm -hmm. Is this a separate division, separate company, or what was the reasoning, Jeff, behind creating the Repurpose Center? Well, a couple things. One is, you know, we saw an opportunity, right? So stepping over to the junk side of the business, you know, I have my partner and I had 
kind of five distinct regions within our organization, right? I mean, so we run a small little transfer station out of Woodenville and one in Tacoma and we're down in Vancouver and Olympia. And then we have a couple satellite ones, Gig Harbor and, and even up in Arlington. And so we were doing those independently and our managers would have relationships with their community. So like, you know, we'll go to have, we have a great relationship up in Ev with the Everett Habitat for, for Humanity. And that's our, that's mm -hmm. our Arlington office works with them on a daily basis, getting them stuff. But, you know, maybe I didn't have that relationship down in Tacoma because maybe we didn't have a, a habitat that was close by or whatever. And so by pulling it all under one umbrella, calling it Repurpose Center, we could start to look at it kind of at the 10,000 foot view and go, okay, you know, I can, we can maybe supersize this partnership here and maybe we need to find some more bulk recyclers down here. And so kind of started looking at it more holistically. And that's just really opened some doors for us. One, just even on the metal side, instead of going to, you know, five or six or 10 different metal recyclers, I can go to one now and I can get better rates, you know? So that mm. saves me because, you know, I don't know if you've been to the dump recently, but you know, you're paying up to 200 bucks a ton to get rid of stuff. And so yeah, it's crazy. Um, so expensive. If I can cut that down to, you know, and we're really cutting it down. I'm, you know, we're, I mean, well, we're trying to recycle a hundred percent, but that's hard. But even if we can cut it down to only 10% of the items we pick up, that means 90% of it we're repurposing. And that's just super cool, you know? And yeah. so, and so we pulled it under one kind of under one entity separated it from junk, but it's still owned by Ben and I. So we're still part of the same organization, but we're running it separately. So like I said, junk is material acquisition, repurpose center is material diversion. I'm living and breathing the diversion side right now. And with that, it's just opening up some really, really cool doors. You know, I have a partnership we're working on with a partner with an old friend from offer up the founding partner, Nick, who's who'd be a great guest on your show. He's doing some super cool stuff in the environment and stuff right now, but those types of things are coming because I leaned into it, put myself out there, said, I'm the president of this organization. Yeah, we don't know what we're doing. But, you know, I just, I pulled some numbers for you. Just so over a million pounds diverted in the first two quarters. Wow. So that's a million pounds of material that would have, that people paid us to take to the landfill and we were able to divert. And so, and that's just the stuff that we could track and record, honestly, you know, based on weight and all that stuff. I mean, there's so much mm -hmm. other stuff we're doing and passing off and, and stuff. And so, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like, let's go. Where's a billion. Let's go. You know, this is our community. And I'm of course, a you know, father of three boys and we love the outdoors and we love the mountains and we love the green and all that stuff. And so let's try to keep it that way. What can we do? You know? And, and so this seems like a really cool vehicle for that. Yeah. And the scale at which you operate, I think must be important. You mentioned Habitat for Humanity. Mm -hmm. I love those stores because yeah. you can go in and find all kinds of really great items from furniture to plumbing to all kinds of stuff. So you can like, what's a typical example, Jeff, of the stuff that somebody calls you and says, hey, can you come pick this up? Is it like bedroom furniture? Is it like an old washing machine? Or like, what are the things yeah, that you haul I, yeah. that you can repurpose? Yeah. So the typical stuff, the most common stuff is, you know, couches, refrigerators, washers, dryers, kind of bigger items that you can't just take curbside. The garbage van won't take your huge couch. And we know that sometimes Goodwill and Value Village won't take the mattress or won't do whatever. And so with us, we take everything that's non-toxic. We can sometimes work with paint because we have some solutions to make them uh, non-toxic. But basically, you know, the initial model was anything two people can carry. But of course, now we do commercial jobs and we do bigger stuff mm -hmm. and we can use some machines and stuff too. But, but yeah, so most people call us because, you know, they've been throwing stuff in their garage or their closet. Moving is the number one generator of junk. And so people don't realize how much junk they have until they go start cleaning out their closets <laughs> and looking under their beds. And then they get what we call a junk fever, which is, oh my God, I got to get rid of all this stuff or whatever. And, you know, in my argument for, you know, the sales side of me is saying, okay, you're paying how much to store this stuff? Square footage is how much for housing here in the Pacific Northwest? We know how much we pay for that garage to be able to, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to park your car in there? You know? And so, yeah, that's kind of how, how we approach it is just like, dude, we're going to free up some space for you. In the end, you're going to end up probably saving some money. And quite frankly, you know, we've seen the way stuff's being man manufactured now when it breaks, it's not like it used to be. You don't, fix a lot of this stuff, you know, yeah. they're down these computer chips or whatever. And, and so it stops working, it's garbage and, you know, and so a lot, 
people are a lot more um, likely to just want to get it out of their hair. And so because we've built the operation in the way, kind of a partner, partner leaning side on the repurpose center side, and then operations, we, you know, we have the team, you know, it's, we're just in a really unique position to manage this material. Yeah. And you told me that your wife is going to be finishing her degree and taking over this in the mm -hmm. fall. And, and you said the beauty of it is that it's partner run, not employee run. So to divert this stuff, you're not having to hire a whole bunch of new people. Yeah. You're just passing it off to a partner organization, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, that's the thing. And so when we first started kind of experimenting with pulling this under RPC, that's what we're calling RPC. We, you pull it under that umbrella. You start looking, you're like, well, holy cow, I have about 50 community partners. Like, let's start to more formalize. What can these guys take more? Can these guys, you know, are these really working for us? Do we need a bigger one here? You know? And so really started to look at the items we were getting at an individual level. I shared a story. I think I shared a story with you a week or two ago when we were testing this model. So, so my wife is getting her degree in industrial and organizational psychology, but she has a real soft spot for local charities and stuff. And so with Repurpose Center, we've uh, developed something called Purpose Partners. And so these would be partners that would be considered for all intents and purposes, a charity, but a lot of them obviously have needs for items that we come across. And so like Sophia Way, you know, helps women in transition. Sometimes they have to leave their living situation very quickly. And so to rehouse them, they're going to need a bed. They're going to need a microwave. They're going to need pots and pans and things. Well, we get those things all the time. And so yeah. that's an easy connect the dots, you know? And so, yeah, so Lynette will be kind of leading our purpose partner division. So she'll be working with all the kind of the local charities to see what they need. And, and so we did an experiment at the beginning of the year as we were kind of formalizing this entity. And I challenged her to find me a charity. I said, find a charity that, that's of interest to you. And her and I are both big, big pet lovers, right? We have a little dog. And, and so she went down to South King County Animal Rescue, I think, and asked them, what type of stuff would you need if you got some donations? And they're like, oh, we could use cages. We could use carrying cases. We could use towels and, you know, these things. And so we went, I went to Jay and my ops managers and I said, okay, for the next two weeks, I want you to collect all the cages, all the, you know, all the carriers, all the whatever, and then get them up to Woodenville. And so two weeks later, I showed up with the truck, loaded as many of them as I could into the truck. I mean, it was full. And then we drove it down to the charity. They, they were so stoked, right? They took as many as they needed. And then they called us two days later and said, hey, you'll be happy to know we found two other charities that were able to use the rest of the items. So, so we helped three charities in two weeks with just a specific line item. And that was wow. kind of one of those light bulb moments. Like, well, what if we did that with everything? You know, what if I, you know, and, and the stuff we don't do, it's like, you know, down in Tacoma, we got one of those smash houses, right? So if it's true junk and well, give them the stuff to break. I mean, no reason for them to break good stuff, you know? And so they break it and then we click it, clean it up, recycle it again, you know? Or, <laughs> so yeah, it's super fun. We do some resale or we're experimenting with resale. We do some garage sales, stuff like that. We do just a ton of direct recycling, like, you know, cardboard, metal, stuff like that. And then my favorite part is, would be the purpose partners, which would be, you know, directly impacting these people and, and doing stuff. And, and, you know, I told you we sponsored one of my son's robotics programs and, you know, they were doing a big clothing drive. I'm like, well, guess what? We get a lot of clothes. In fact, we <laughs> flooded them a little bit. And so next year we're having to rethink, probably cut out the middleman. We'll just do it directly with them. But it's so cool to be able to do that and to go say, hey, they're trying to raise, you know, a hundred bags of, of clothing. And I'm like, well, here's 50. You guys are, you, you know, we'll start you off. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, that's just so personally fulfilling, you know? Well, at the volume that you guys operate, I mean, that's, I think it's hard for just the average person like me to understand the, the massive volume that you yeah. guys deal in. So yeah, yeah, in a few days, you could get a lot of stuff put together. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, and one of the challenges with running a recycling company is a lot of these smaller charities or these smaller partners, you know, great. We give you the truckload of stuff. They're like, cool. I can't take anymore. I don't have anywhere to store it. <laughs> And I'm like, guess what? The stuff's still coming in. So, yeah. so we're constantly trying to refine our partnership list and, you know, find strategic partners that can help us with the cause. So kind of the way we've approached it is there's plenty of good work to be done. You know what I mean? And so we can find, find people. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm always super excited when I find some person relatively young in their career that's super into the, the diversion stuff or the green stuff. It's like, well, let's figure it out. What can we do? You know, and so we'll try a lot of different things. One thing I'd like to talk about with you, Jeff, is how you handle adversity as a business owner. 
uh, you told me that 2010 was one of the most challenging times for you. What mm-hmm. was going on then? What were the biggest challenges? And I mean, your mindset, you strike me as not a guy that just throws up his hands and says, oh, well, but you <laughs> you just kind of dig in and say, well, let's solve this. But I, I'd love for you to share some strategies that you've come up with to deal with those really hard times. Yeah. Probably like anybody, I throw my hands up, but I think probably unlike most people, my hands come back down and I'm ready to take action because that's, I've dealt with my share of uh, adversity in my life and I realized that wallowing in it has never, <laughs> never been a good strategy for me at least. And so, yeah, 2010, 2009, 2010, super difficult. Obviously, the United States was experiencing a, probably one of the biggest downturns we've had, right? I mean, you know, the financial crisis, I don't know if you remember but it was happening on the East Coast before it was happening on the West Coast. For us operators, we know because in 2008, I grew like 40%. In 2009, my business grew 60%. And so I was feeling pretty cocky, right? I mean, I'm looking at all these people that are saying, oh, we're dying here because of this thing. And I'm, I just grew 60%, you know. And then in 2010, boom, we got gutted. Half our revenue went away. And, you know, as soon as it hit the housing market here in Pacific Northwest, movies, the number one generator of junk it hurt us. It hurt us a lot. And at that point I had built the business enough to where I was experimenting with some satellite locations. So I had some new leases. I had some trucks I was investing in. So, you know, I started very quickly got over my skis. We had just acquired Tacoma from a buddy of mine that was running it and it got to be too complicated for him. And so I was like, I want to buy that even though it's a downturn, I want to buy it. And so that was happening. And then I found out I was diagnosed with uh, testicular cancer. And so that happened. And, and so it was just boom, 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 you know, stuff just on top of it. And um, it was just a really, really tough time. And so, so, oh, and then that same year, we found out that my admin that I had brought over from T-Mobile had systematically stolen like, like $25,000 from me that year that I was liquidating all my 401k to pay my staff. So it was just one of those entrepreneurial moments that, you know, we like to say until you've failed a business, you're not really an entrepreneur. So that was really a tipping point where it could have been pretty crazy. But, you know, for me, it was, it was really kind of getting back to your question, you know, faced with adversity, adversity. I try, I try not to make it worse than it is. I try to break it down to the smallest components and then just lean in and deal. And so that's what we did. You know, I mean, with the business, with some of the stealing and some of the theft, you know, we had to get the, we had to get small, you know, and, and, you know, I remember going to a couple of my key people and I'm like, look guys, I've eaten top ramen before I'll eat it again. Like, this is not what we're building here. This is what we're building. And so we redoubled down and, you know, we're super proud of the culture we built, but we had to go through all that, you know, I mean, hiring the wrong people, not doing the right training, not taking care of the trucks the right way, all the things you know, the corners that are, you're tempted to cut, or maybe you don't even realize you're cutting, you know? And so really at that point, just really looked at what we had and said, all right, at the smallest level, we know we still have a great concept. We know it's going to come back around. This is a temporary thing with the economy. So that was that. As far as the cancer stuff, you know, fortunately, testicular cancer is a very curable cancer. So leaned right into it, ended up following up with some radiation just to make sure I got it all. And so I've Mm -hmm. been you know, over 15 years cancer free now. And so that, that was good, but it was, oh, that's great. you know, it was tough and it was trying and, and, you know, and there was a point even shortly after that, when I did partner up the business, you know, I mean, I'll be honest, there was a point where I probably would have paid somebody to get out of the mess I was in. You know what I mean? I had debt, I had all these things and I had the, the benefit of a really strong mentor group in entrepreneur organization of Seattle. Some of my best friends now, but I was a part of that group and I kind of put it to a bunch of CEOs and said, guys, I need some help. Like, what would you, you know, I'm tempted to exit. And so they, you know, we put together a strategy, very thoughtful strategy. I did end up partnering up to take some money off the table and to kind of square up the business. And that's when Ben came in. But, you know, mm-hmm. fortunately I, I held on to, you know, a big chunk of the business. I'm still a 45% owner of that entity. And then since then we've, you know, we've started a commercial commercial division and we have another service company. And then now of course repurpose center. So we're building it. And, you know, at that point my business had gone down. I, you know, I was probably lost 60% of the revenue. So it went from being a, you know, I was doing a couple million in revenue a year down to under a million again. And then since bringing Ben in, we've 
over 10 X the business, you know? So it's been a, it's been a nice, it was a good decision. I'm, you know, and I I'm working, you know, and I worked myself out of a job. So part of me bringing Ben in to run operations was to allow me to go back to back to get a day job for a while, because, you know, when your business for self health insurance is a thing and before Obamacare, you couldn't get health insurance. So I was being self-insured and all this mm. stuff. And so I went back to work for T-Mobile for a stint again. Thank you, T-Mobile. They were great to me to bring me back in. And so I, I did another run with them while I was kind of moonlighting with this business. So that helped me get through it. But I knew that the pain I was experiencing was temporary. I knew that we could get through it. And so just dug deep and, and again, surrounded myself with amazing people. My wife, you know, I, I fell in love with her before we got married, but I really <laughs> fell in love with her when she stuck with me through that nonsense. So Jeff, at the darkest point of that period, I mean, were you hopeful that, that times would change? Did you know that it wasn't a permanent situation? Yeah, I think, you know, I think part of it is I think I'm generally kind of an optimist. And so I think I kind of knew and I had, once I stopped feeling sorry for myself, I realized that this wasn't God punishing me or something. This was happening to probably the majority of business owners across the United States. And so again, it was super important for me to kind of circle up with my tribe and kind of lean on people and figure out a way out. And so, you know, pick my trusted advisors with my wife's support and we just went after it. And, and in fact, at that time, because I was looking for ways to make more money and, and the phones weren't ringing on the junk side, I actually got involved with another startup called Frogbox, which is another Canadian based kind of French. Well, it wasn't a franchise model at the time, but it was kind of gearing up to be a franchise basically in the moving industry, moving sustainable moving supplies. So instead of cardboard, you'd plastic totes and whatever. And so my business partner at the time was on a show called Dragon's Den, which is like Shark Tank in the United States. Uh, so it's Canada's version of Shark Tank. And he hit it off and he got a deal and he got a couple dragons in. And so instantly overnight, we were beamed across Canada. And so we're getting all these calls to franchise. And so I was the first franchise partner in the United States, but we didn't really know what we had yet. I mean, it was, we we're still trying to figure out the cost structure and, you know, it was just a really great business, but I couldn't make a lot of money at it. I noodled with that business for, I think, seven years until I finally had to say, you know what, my junk business is, is 10 times that size and it's not giving, it, it's not keeping me up at night the way this business is. And so, <laughs> so I sold back to my partners at Frogbox let them run it as a corporate store. And then really at that point, doubled down on the junk side and said, let's try to do this really well. Yeah. You know? Jeff, what's your best advice to someone who might want to be an entrepreneur? It sounds like one of your teenagers has already started one of his business at what the age, <laughs> age of yeah. 13. My middle son, my two youngest are twins, but he's middle son by about three minutes. But yeah, he started CH services this summer in my community, helping my neighbors with vacation needs, like, you know, watering plants, taking the garbage out, letting the dog out, whatever. And he's earned like, you know, five clients or whatever. And so I gave to my business partner on this other venture, who's starting this, this program with offer up. And I taught my 13 year old about analysis paralysis, right? He was spending all this time working on his logo and doing this stuff. And I'm like, Hey, at some point you just got to go knock on a door, you know, and go earn a client, you know? And with Yash, it was the same thing. I'm like, Hey, Yash, sure been in a lot of meetings, but at some point you got to stop meeting. You got to go out and go, go do something. You know what I mean? Kind of like, and so I think for entrepreneurs, you know, I think that's kind of been our secret sauce is just being the first to jump, just saying, hey, if it's, you know, 60% baked, 80% baked, sometimes that's good enough to get started. Don't wait till it's 100% baked because, you know, how many people have said, oh man, I wish I would have done this, you know, well, not all the stars are always going to be aligned. Sometimes you got to force align them, you know, and so that's, that's probably it is just do it, just go, you know, and it's not failure if you never quit, right? It's just learning. And, you know, I think that's where our friend Dan is, you know, he's very much about, you know, go fail forward, go, you know, lean, try something. Let's see, we don't know where this is going to go. But so that's been another kind of secret that I have is just, you know, this kind of level of grit that if, if you never quit, you know, it's not failure. So it's, it's just learning. Yeah. How did COVID impact your business? Because man, it just seems like COVID was so specific as to how it impacted. You look at 
like that was probably the best thing that ever happened to Amazon because yeah. we were all separated. We're all at home and, oh, they have an infrastructure to deliver anything to anyone in the world. But for your business specifically, did, did business dry up or what was the COVID impact for you? Yeah. So we had some, it was unique. Downturns are like cancer, right? We talk about cancer. I didn't like talking about my cancer because there's way more extreme cancers. And I know there's business owners that had it way worse than we had. So fortunately for us within junk, we were able to have the state consider us a necessary service. So we didn't get shut down. They, you know, I worked hard to lump us in with waste management and some of the garbage re removal companies or whatever, because, you know, I mean, you stop hauling stuff, people can get messy really fast. And so, so that helped, I was able to stay operations, but you know, the social distancing, those types of things became really tricky. Like instead of sending two people out in one truck, I'd send two people out in two trucks wearing masks. And so that got a little bit expensive or whatever, but you know, we managed through it pretty well. I'd say post COVID has been a little bit more challenging for us, you know, with COVID people were discovering, holy cow, I need to have somewhere to do this meeting in my, I need to empty out this room so I can make a home office or, you know, those types of things, or, Hey, I'm going to start gardening again. So I need to get rid of this stuff. And so we were able to kind of exploit some of those opportunities, but, but post COVID as people started going back to work and, and, you know, the economy was still, it still is a little bit tough. So we're, again, we mirror housing, we mirror a few other things. And so we're just, you know, we're just keeping, you know, keeping, keeping moving forward and, and trying to do things better. And, and when the revenue has taken a hit, we've really focused on profitability and trying to run more efficiently. And so again, part of what came out of COVID was this double down on repurpose center and that's because, you know, really just looking at everything we're doing and how can we do it better, you know? Yeah. You told me that during COVID, you decided to make your health a, a big priority in your life. How has that changed who you are and how you show up in business? Man, that's a whole nother podcast, Mark, because let me tell you, <laughs> it, it did change my life. I, so I told you, I went back and got a day job for a while. Well, my day job was working for my mentor and I was doing traveling sales and I was selling call center space in India and doing all of these cool, fun things with my clients. And I had telecom clients like Dish Network and T-Mobile as clients. And so I was doing some fun stuff, but then COVID hit and I was a traveling salesperson in telecom. No one was making any moves. I couldn't travel. And I'm working for my mentor who I deeply, deeply care about. And so I was like, you know, this doesn't make sense for me to stay on payroll anymore. And I was considering an exit anyway. And so I just sped that up. And I said, rather than, uh, you know, I was 48 at the time, rather than waiting until I'm 50, I'm going to just do it now. And so I quit my day job that gave me some bandwidth and freed up some time. And, you know, I've had health issues through, throughout my whole life. I've been as, as high as, you know, 365 pounds and and so I really wanted to address this once and for all as I'm getting older. And, you know, my kids are at an age where we want to do stuff together and I need to be in the kind of shape to do it. And I came to Lynette and I said, you know, rather than go find another day job, rather than jump right back into the business day to day, which is super easy to do at any point. I said, why don't I just, you know, for a while here, let's treat my health like it's my job. And so I'd wake up in the morning and I started doing a lot of the, a lot of the atomic habits type stuff, you know, the, um, these tiny habits over time, how they build on themselves. And so I would, you know, get up during the 5 a.m. club. Sometime during five o'clock, I'd get up. You know, I did uh, a challenge called the 75 hard to kick it off. And that's 75 days, no alcohol, drink a gallon of water a day, work out, work out twice a day for at least 45 minutes. One of them has to be outside. So all these things. So I started these habits and I did it over 75 days and I was feeling so great that I'm like, I'm not going to stop. And so I was like, can I do it for 150 days? And so, and so then it's, and then I was like, I'm going to do it for a year. And, you know, of course I make adjustments and some stuff comes and goes and, you know, I still pick up a beer once in a while or whatever. So some of that fell off, but, but it's just really kind of the positivity and all the learning, you know, and then going on these walks, I was, you know, I was doing walks and I had had knee surgery. And so my knee surgeon, great guy suggested I start rucking, which is, you know, throwing a pack on that's weighted because he didn't want me to start running because I'm a, again, I'm a big man. So, and I had run in the past and got, had some issues. And so, so I started doing that. And, and with all that time, yeah, I'd go out in these rucks for an hour and a half, two hours. So I started listening to podcasts and audiobooks, And, and so I was just filling my head with just this 
awesome information and and it just started opening doors i mean i was doing some i was doing some reflecting on the way so i you know video myself on my youtube channel and so that got some got me in touch with some people that were having similar challenges and we talked about it and it just really got me kind of opening to what could be next and then of course uh repurpose center came around while i was doing this and Nick, and I'm just convinced a lot of it was just the universe had kind of opened up to me because I started looking at it in a different way, mm. you know? Wow. That's inspiring. Yeah. And I, I saw you in person the other day and man, you look fit. You look fit <laughs> and strong. As I told you, I would not mess with you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and like I said, please don't anyway, but uh, I'm a gentle giant, but no, it's, it's funny. In fact, part of this whole exercise thing is, you know, my, my, my kids are, wanting to get in the gym. They're all at that age, 12, 13, where they're going through growth spurts and stuff. Yeah. And they don't want to get left behind by their classmates. So we're going into the gym. And so all of a sudden now I'm starting to bulk up, look like my old rugby self again. And I'm like, yeah, it's been fun. Well, as we wrap things up, Jeff, this has been such a rewarding time. I really want to end on the idea that my boss, Dan Rogers had when he decided to found this podcast, Beats Working. And, you know, Dan really believes and we believe that that work can be the most honorable thing in, in the universe. It can develop us into the best human beings that we can possibly be. It can do such good in the world at the same time. I think for a lot of people in this country, work is kind of broken. You know, they hate mm -hmm. their job, they go to work, they wish they had something different. You seem to have created through work this source of energy and fulfillment and happiness, just talking with you and looking at you and hearing your life story, Jeff, it just seems to me that you figured out how to use work as just an amazing tool. So I'd love some thoughts from, from you, advice to other maybe business leaders or managers on how to make work better for everyone. Yeah. I love the work you're doing. I love this podcast. I love the idea of work isn't just a bucket. You know, there's work and then there's family and then there's friendships and relationships and then there's health. What if it's all just one big bucket, you know? And I think that's how I started looking at it, realizing that, you know, my business is a vehicle for things just the same way that my relationships are part of my network and that's a vehicle. And, the, you know, and so when you start looking at it kind of overall, and so I've never, um, at least in the last probably five years, you know, I haven't really looked at it like work. It's like, this is what I do. You know, I mean, my job is, yeah, sometimes I move around money within the organization to try to reprioritize things. And, you know, I get to do these awesome events with charities that are super meaningful to me. So I'm living my values and I'm showing my kids what it means to be community forward and things like that. And, you know, my wife and I are on this, this health journey together and she's, you know, forwarding her education and we're going to be able to tie that into some of the work we're doing within the business. And so, so we just, you know, I call it a machine. We've created this machine, you know, and it's just, it's just been great. And then we pull people in, you know? And so, so I think just perspective is a lot of it, just really looking at it differently and saying, it doesn't have to be, okay, I'm off work now at five. Now I have to an hour to take care of my health. And then I have to go do this. It's like, no, what if during work, I'm going for my walk with my friend who happens to also have a business and maybe we're doing some mentoring and maybe I'm listening to a podcast. that's going to help me with a presentation I'm going to give with you. You know what I mean? Those types of things. And, and if you can look at it that way, it all just kind of flows together and it's, it could be a really fun and exciting thing. And I'm probably more energized in my career than I've ever been probably working less hours than I ever have that, that might have something to do with it, but it's because I don't consider it work. You know, I mean, like in September, I'm going on a, my second long dirt bike ride of the year, but I'm going with someone who I admire from a business perspective. We figured out a way to carve out some days. We happen to be riding motorcycles, but we're going to be mentoring. We're going to be sharing ideas, brainstorming, all these things. And so there's just so much value that comes out of kind of looking at things that way. You know? And it seems like at the heart of it, Jeff, going back to your days, early days in telecom, that the way you showed up then in terms of just honoring people yeah, really has allowed you to grow this business where people want to do stuff for Jeff. They want to help Jeff because of the way that you honor them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just being your authentic self, right? Like stop trying to be the person you think your boss wants you to be. And I mean, if you follow me on social media, you know, I stopped showing up in the tie and doing the nice profile picture. I'm probably wearing a Hawaiian shirt or, you know, on a dirt bike or something. It's like, 
because that's who I am. Right. And, and it turns out when I'm just who I am, like people seem to like that better. They seem to respond better. It's like, oh, I want a little piece of that. That's good action. You know, so that's how that's how I'm ro rolling with it right now. You know. Well, Jeff Hill, this has been super rewarding and I'm excited to see what you do next because it seems like everything that you touch becomes something amazing or it becomes, wait for it, a learning experience. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Just, <laughs> just another, uh, another learning along the way. But yeah, this has been really great, Mark. I, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited for our friendship. I think uh, I, I've really enjoyed getting to know you a little bit. I think we got some stuff to talk about outside of work too, and maybe even get, get you out on the golf course one of these days. And you can, yeah. you can teach me how to show up. I'm proud to say, I think my team was last place at the tournament we were at in, uh, <laughs> on Monday. And so I told my buddies, I'm like, look, either I'm gonna have to recruit some other guys or we're gonna have to practice because because <laughs> something's got to give here. I can't have Macklemore making fun of me anymore. You know, <laughs> I think I think it was President Kennedy who said, show me someone who's good at golf, and I'll show you someone neglecting some part of their life. <laughs> <laughs> amen. 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 Uh, Thanks. This is great. Jeff, this has been awesome. Keep in touch, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Mark. I'm Mark Wright. Thanks for listening to Beats Working, part of the Work P2P family. New episodes drop every Monday. If you've enjoyed the conversation, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Special thanks to show producer Tamar Medford. In the coming weeks, you'll hear from our Contributors Corner and Sidekick Sessions. Join us next week for another episode of Beats Working, because getting paid to practice beats working to get paid.